Imagine being wrongly imprisoned in a country far from home. What would you think about? How would you cope? Rick Westhead has the remarkable story of a former college athlete who found himself behind bars in Syria and how hockey of all things helped him survive. Sam Goodwin grew up in a hockey family, the oldest of five. We like to say that our faith life was more important than our hockey life, but hockey was certainly a close second. Some of my best memories are playing street hockey with my brothers in the driveway. There was a lot of equipment in our house and in the car all the time. I remember I had a friend get in the car and be like, what's that smell? And I'm like, I don't even smell it. I don't even know what you're talking about because I was so immune to it. The Goodwins lived in Bowling Green, Ohio, and cheered for the Red Wings until Sam was 12, when the family moved to St. Louis and their allegiance changed. The Blues were immediately a part of our life. It was very common for us to spend hours on end at the dinner table talking about the Blues, different players. And in St. Louis, current and former Blues players were very involved in minor hockey. Sam's first coach, as I remember when we, we moved here, was Basil McCray. Oh, but Gray really hammering with her right. Oh, baby! He was certainly very intense. You know, old school hockey, which I think that resonated with me and Sam. You learn how to battle through adversity. You learn how to make the most out of tough situations. Sam was undersized, but an excellent skater and he earned a scholarship to play hockey at Niagara University in Niagara Falls, New York. When he graduated in 2012, he wasn't sure what he wanted to do. So he took a job with a family friend halfway around the world in Singapore. During my time there, I took advantage of the opportunity to explore as much of the region and beyond as possible. Some colleagues and I, we would go and coach as well. We'd coach kids in, in Singapore in the Philippines. We also coached hockey in North Korea and Turkmenistan and in India. Make a pass, okay, same thing, loop. And in early 2018, I realized that I had traveled to 120 countries in the world. And at that point, I remember thinking, maybe I could go to all of them. Over here, over here. Frankly, I was obsessed with my travel journey. The priority was the experiences, and that's what I put everything into. Ooh! I felt like kind of the rest of us were, you know, getting married or starting to date and kind of going more the traditional route. And uh, Sam being the oldest, we're like, when is he just gonna be done with all this? I really thought that nothing was gonna happen in Sam's life until he had traveled to all 193 countries. I certainly didn't support my brother going to countries that are very hostile towards Americans. It kind of seemed like it was reckless and not worth going to these countries for what seemed to be an Instagram post. The 2018 season started miserably for the Blues, but after a mid-season coaching change, they went on a miraculous run from dead last in early January to a playoff spot. The Blues turnaround has been stunning. Oh my, this is getting special. Sam went to game four of the Blues' first round series against the Jets, but watched the rest on TV. From Nauru in the South Pacific. The St. Louis Blues are headed to the Western Conference Final. From Singapore and from the United Arab Emirates. And then I watched the Blues beat the Sharks in the Western Conference Final from Erbil, Iraq. For the first time in 49 years, the St. Louis Blues are headed to the Stanley Cup Final. On May 25th, two days before Game 1 of the Stanley Cup Final, Sam crossed from Iraq into Syria, a fractured country in the midst of a civil war widely considered to be one of the most dangerous countries in the world. The Syrian government was an authoritarian regime led by President Bashar al-Assad. 
a man notorious for using chemical weapons on his own citizens. Sam entered the northeastern part of Syria and went to the town of Kamishli, which at the time was hundreds of miles away from combat. A couple hours after arriving, I was talking to my mom on FaceTime. He was panning the landscape and I saw like outdoor cafes and street markets and it looked like a really idyllic place. As I was talking to her, this armed military officer approaches me and he points at me and he tells me to come to his side of the road. Then I just hear, I'm talking to my mom. And then the line goes quiet. I called him right back and I couldn't get through. And so I tried to put it out of my mind that maybe the internet had dropped, but I didn't like the way that sounded. They took me just up the road to a building that seemed to be some kind of military office. And for the next three hours, I was essentially interrogated. They were very skeptical about my travel motives and my travel history. And they accused me of coming to Syria with, with bad intentions. I was scared, confused, and I was desperately trying to understand what was going on. After one night in a jail cell in Kamishli, Sam was flown in the cargo hold of a Syrian military plane to Damascus. I was driven to the center of town and taken into the basement of a facility that I now know is called Syria's Military Intelligence Prison Number 215, a facility notoriously known for housing political prisoners. It's known to be essentially a human slaughterhouse. After a couple of days, when the family still hadn't heard from Sam, they took action. Different people were chasing different leads, but we were certainly working with the Vatican. We were working with some NGOs on the ground in Syria. We were working with some journalists. We cast the net very wide. The FBI told us that if the word got out and into the wrong hands and it was made public, they'd probably immediately kill Sam or make his situation worse and use it as leverage. So it was very, very important that this was super, super hush-hush. From day one, they said, hey, like this is tough for us. Like We don't really have much representation in Syria or in that region. It would be wise to manage your expectations, which you know we could kind of read through what they were saying. Like There's a chance we might not ever see Sam again. The only thing might be if you find someone who has any influence on Assad. The FBI said 100% the only way that Sam will be released is if Assad signs off. That just seemed overwhelming to me. Just how is, how is this gonna happen? But my husband, right away, he says, okay, this is what we have to do. We have to find an influencer of Assad. I wasn't gonna sit still and not make this my top priority. In the evenings, I would spend an hour working out, and then I'd spend another two or three hours by myself kind of organizing what happened that day, getting prepared for the next day. You know, that was, that was my approach. And as long as I was staying busy on this and felt that, you know, we were making progress every day. I mean, that's, that's how I got through it. Solitary confinement is torture. It's designed to break you. Every day I would hear the sounds of inmates in neighboring cells screaming from being beaten and tortured. I'm not sure I knew what fear was until I heard a grown man screaming for his life. The cell wasn't too small. I could walk around just a little bit, but it had no window. It was all concrete. I had nothing but a small blanket to lay on the cement floor as a bed. 
I realized very quickly that I needed to maintain a connection to the outside. It was something that helped me remain emotionally and psychologically in tune, so I fought very hard to keep track of, of the days. Inside my cell, I chipped this rock off the cell wall, and I carved a calendar into the wall. And when I would go to bed, I would mark an X. I also knew that the Blues were playing in the final. I knew when those first four games were, and I put small marks on the calendar for those four games so that I could think about that when it happened and have a few seconds of kind of relief. On June 12th, the St. Louis Blues were in Boston for a winner-take-all Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final. And Tag watched at the bar. That was a really, really hard day. Just awful. That was the first time in my life I had seen my husband overserved, as they say. Tarasenko sent one in front. Score! I didn't want to watch it with a bunch of guys. Wanted to watch it by myself. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, you know, is this really real? For the first time in their history, the St. Louis Blues are the Stanley Cup champions. 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 Sam had been gone for three weeks now, and there was very, very, very little hope. Up until that point, it was like throwing darts in the dark. There was nothing that was really concretely sticking. Everyone was telling us this wasn't going to end well. Everyone told us to manage our expectations or that we would never see our brother again. There were like no words. I just felt like this is, this is going to take a miracle. When we return. There was no greater moment of relief in my life. In the darkest days, a ray of hope. I think I genuinely like jumped up and down a couple times. When W5 continues. By June 14th of 2019, Sam Goodwin had been missing in Syria for three weeks, and his sister Stephanie was losing hope. It was always in the afternoons I felt like I was having the hardest time with things. My escape was always going on a run. Something came over me that I felt like I really needed to tell somebody something. And the only person that came to mind was Steph my old college roommate. So I call Steph and I say, you're never gonna believe this. My brother went missing in Syria. And she says, that is so awful. Is there anything I can do to help? And I said, from what I'm told, unless you know someone who's friends with Assad, all you can do is pray. And her response was, is it okay if my dad calls your dad? And I said, yeah, it is, yeah. Tag spoke with Stephanie Hajar's father, George, and learned that his brother-in-law, Stephanie's uncle Joseph, had a connection with a Lebanese general named Abbas Ibrahim, the head of an intelligence agency called the General Security Directorate. As it turns out, you know, his friend, the general, is one of the few people in Lebanon that have a relationship with, with President Assad. That was probably the first time that I'd heard somebody as confident. I don't think he said we could be successful, but I, he goes, Tag, I can help. On June 22nd, Sam was transferred to Adra prison in Damascus, the largest civilian prison in Syria. He was around other prisoners for the first time. There was a phone at Adra that would get passed around between the cells. There were two rules with the phone, though. One is the only language that could be spoken was Arabic, and two, all calls had to be made within Syria. So it was totally useless for me. But as I watched this phone being passed around and people talking to family members or whoever, I approached one of my friends and 
I said, hey, would it be possible for you to call someone in your family, whoever you're talking to, and then have them send a message to my sister? So I'm at my uncle's lake house in Sunapee, New Hampshire, and my phone goes off, and it's an Instagram message from an account called Black Chrysanthemum. And it's like, hi, my name is Doa, my brother in prison with your brother. And I am like freaking out right now. I'm like, I cannot believe this. I jump off the couch. I'm like dialing my dad before I even like finish reading the message. I'm like, all right, well, let's send him something back. We got to get it fast. I want him to know that he got it to us. And so we say, hi, Doa, thank you so much for getting this message to us. Is there anything else you can tell me about my brother? And please tell him I cannot wait to eat a Chipotle burrito with him. And the reason I said Chipotle burrito was because we always eat Chipotle together. It was the next day, about 24 hours later, and Sam says, I love, oh, he said, I love you too. I can't wait to eat a Chipotle burrito together. And did the Blues win the cup? And for me, this was just like the best ever because like you just don't know, like even if he's alive, you don't know like what his mental state is and you don't know like if he's been tortured and like even the fact that he could like ask the question, even just ask the question like, did the Blues win the cup? Like that he can't even think about that. I was just like so over the moon. A few days later, my fellow inmate said that he had a message back and it said the Blues won the cup. I was like, like, I think I genuinely like jumped up and down a couple times. And at that point, I knew that I had established contact. Despite the joy they felt at connecting with Sam, the family still had no word on if or when he would be released. We really had all of our eggs in one basket, it felt like at that point. So if that path went dark, like every other path had, ooh, we really, really had nothing at that point. Then on July 26th, the breakthrough they'd been praying for, a phone call from Joseph. Incredibly, General Ibrahim had secured Sam's release and the family needed to get to Beirut as soon as possible. There was no greater you know, moment of relief in my life. I was just like absolutely elated, like just like running around outside, like crying, like I could not believe this, that like a miracle like basically had been done unto our family. At the same time, Sam was escorted out of Adra prison and driven quickly out of Damascus. We came up to a checkpoint, one that seemed to be some kind of significant border. And as we passed through the officer in the vehicle sitting next to me, he said, Sam, you're in Lebanon. You're safe now. Everything happened extremely quickly. We landed in Beirut and traveled at a high rate of speed to a military office. We get out of this vehicle and we ride this elevator up and they open it up and Sam is right there and I just hugged him and just, you know, Sam, I just love you so much. And I go, are you okay? And he said, yes. And then I said, did they hurt you? And he said, no. That was indescribably emotional and a, frankly a breathtaking display of God answering prayers. You know, all in all, he looked he looked pretty good. You know, once we got comfortable that Sam was okay, so to speak, he quickly was asking about the St. Louis Blues <laughs> Stanley Cup. <laughs> The security let us past so that we could be at the gate to get Sam. First one off the plane, he held a little plastic bag and we just came running up to him and held him. And yeah, I remember him holding me and he was like, you're unbelievable, thanks so much for everything. One of the most overwhelming things for me was learning about all the efforts that were made on my behalf from people who loved me to people who had no idea who I was and everywhere in between. And it's several years later, now and I'm still saying thank you. In the months that followed his return home, Sam completed his travel journey, 
and in the years since, he's become an advocate for political hostages and the wrongfully detained. Over the past several years, I've been speaking publicly about my experiences, but more importantly, about what I think others can take from it. I'm nothing special. I just found a strength inside of me that we all have within ourselves. What I tell young athletes is that you might not even be aware of the skills and traits that you're developing. I'm not totally sure that I was, but I can tell you that the harder you work now, the better you'll be prepared in the world. What I've learned to be true is that we can't always choose the exact path that we take in life, but we can always choose. We can always choose the way in which we walk it. I don't want to be known for the things that happened to me. I want to be known for the way I've responded to them. A book about Sam's ordeal in Syria is due out next year. We'll be right back. W5 Stephen Dewar and Chuck Green flew down to Miami this week to see if Muhammad Ali is really the guy he says he is. And I ain't gonna be joking. I'll be pecking and a poking, pouring water on his smoking. It was billed as the fight of the century Muhammad Ali versus Smoking Joe Frazier. I'm the champ, and I'll make them all eat their words. The year is 1971, and W5 caught up with Ali as he prepared for his return to the ring after being stripped of his heavyweight title for his controversial stance on the war in Vietnam. Very few people uh, know how to go about finding what's the best purpose in their life that they should try to fulfill. And mine was just to be the world heavyweight champion. And then also not only being the champion, but keeping my dignity, my pride, my manhood, not Uncle Tom, as, as they say, selling out my people just for the white man's dollar. You can see that entire documentary as well as all of our news stories on W5's official YouTube channel. I'm Avery Haynes. On behalf of everyone here at W5, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.